you are free once again to be the person that we touch. Our presence and care are the greatest gifts. It is our responsibility to care for our body and mind. Take a deep breath and come back to the present moment. When we transform our mind, we transform our mind. Join us at Love Center and journey with us to make happiness your responsibility. for your attention. So now over to Ajahn Brahm. Yay! So thank you everybody for joining again. And this uh, evening we have some more questions. If there are any more questions, are all the questions answered already? So it doesn't matter how long you spend answering questions, there will always be more until the time comes when you can be really peaceful. And when you're very peaceful, all those questions just disappear. If you've ever done this, sometimes I remember just going to one, uh, to one place and, whoops, I can't, get my, there we go, to one great monk. And I had all these questions for him. And I was about eight, nine years as a monk and, this monk had all these important questions and I had to wait for my appointment to see him. And I remember just going into his room with all these questions in my mind, which I've waited days to actually get the appointment to ask him. And as soon as I went into my room, he just blasted me with this beautiful loving kindness. And I was so peaceful, so calm. And I didn't have any more questions. All the questions sort of evaporated. And he had this beautiful sense of peace and kindness, and gentleness. I always remember that. That's the place where all questions end, in deep peace and kindness. Anyway, here we go. <coughs> the first question of today. And if I'm asked, answering the questions too quickly, please give me feedback. I just know there's so many questions, and I, I always respect questions so much, I try to answer as many as I can, as best as I can. So anyway, here we go. Uh, during meditation on the breath while lying down in a yoga session and see beautiful yellow light forming a sitting Buddha. Is it dreaming or Nimitta? That's almost certainly Nimitta you're seeing. Lovely, well done. And it's not dreaming. It's you're getting into the, the mind. If that happens next time, then you know, just when you're seeing the beautiful Nimitta, I hope it's a, a beautiful Nimitta, or beautiful Buddha, or yellow light. They say, beautiful yellow light, great. So see if you can stay with it, and just let it be. And don't be afraid of it. And see if by being still with that beautiful yellow light, you can get more yellow, more bright, until it becomes incredibly bright. You don't have to be afraid of it at all, because it's an imitator, and it gets so incredibly beautiful, and wonderful, and bright. And that'll take you into deep meditations. I haven't said this yet, but you know, sometimes it does happen that on these retreats, somebody does get into beautiful nimittas and even into a jhana state. It's rare, but it does happen. And if it does, and you're seeing someone sitting so perfectly still and they're missing their lunch, please don't wake them up. Please don't bring them out because it's a beautiful experience and you don't want to disturb them. Let them stay there. And if any any of you, especially if you're doing lying down meditation and you see a person becoming so still, you think they're dead. Because sometimes you get so still that you're hardly breathing at all, or sometimes you're actually not breathing. And don't be afraid because you're perfectly okay. But if you want to check out how that person is, just touch them very gently 
and see if they are warm or if they are cold. This is actually said in the suttas that if a person is in a deep meditation, they're always the body's warm. It's only when they're dead, the body goes cold. And this has happened many times that people who get into deep meditation, you touch them and they're, they're still warm. So great, they're having a wonderful time, leave them alone. But you don't need to be afraid at all because it's a wonderful thing. You come out of those states, you're really blissed out and some diseases tend to disappear and you feel so healthy. If you know what they are and have one or two experiences of those, oh, you'll never be afraid of them at all. They're wonderful places to go. So anyway, whoever asks that question, it's almost certainly a limiter. You weren't dreaming, you were relaxing. Well done. Next question, dear Ajahn Brahm, is it breaking the precepts to tell kids that Santa Claus and tooth fairies are real, like they don't exist? Does it mean one is lying? It's not, not really intended to deceive the kids because what actually is real and what is not real, the sense of like tooth fairies and Santa Claus, it's like an idea. The idea is real. The person is not real, obviously, but the idea is real. And the beautiful uh, imagination of children and to see goodness in the world, to see tooth fairies so they're not afraid when they lose a tooth. You know what, sometimes kids, they lose a tooth and they think they've lost it forever. And they've just got a big hole in their teeth and they're going to be ugly forever. So I'd say there's a tooth fairy, giving them a positive, you can probably find you know, some uh, money under your, your pillow the following day. And of course, you know, the parents put some money under their, their pillow or whatever you do. And later on, <laughs> okay, one of my personal stories. You know, my mother, my father, when my brother and I were very young, maybe about seven or he was seven, maybe I was five, we would go into the woods sometime and he would go on a treasure hunt. And on the treasure hunt, we'd find little coins, sixpences and shillings, which were worth a lot of money to a kid that time, many years ago. And we'd pick them up and pick them up. And my father thought it was a wonderful way to entertain his children. It was very exciting. Until I'm not sure, it's probably me who led on to my father and said, hey, why don't you drop some more money? He said, what, you know where this money comes from? He said, yeah, we knew a long time ago. We weren't going to tell you because otherwise we wouldn't get the treasure. So a lot of the time the kids know that the tooth fairies and Santa Claus aren't real, but nevertheless, we like to have these beautiful ideas that you know, there's good people in this world and good things in this world. And if you are a kind, good person, then you get rewards. It's a beginning of teaching, teaching people about the rewards of goodness. And you say, but that is lying, you say. But look, when I was a school teacher teaching physics, I had to teach the law of gravity, you know, to uh, 11 year olds and say, what goes up comes down. That's not true, but it's close enough to be true. And it's worthwhile saying. And then later on, you teach about the Newton's law of gravity, you know, just before O levels. And that's not true either. You've got Einstein's general theory of relativity or special theory, of, no, general theory about space time being curved. So each one of these is just an approximation. It's not intentionally deceiving a kid, it's giving them something to work with until later on they can actually have a greater understanding of this world. So I consider this training, not lying. We're not intending to deceive. We're giving them some teachings which they can understand so they can go deeper. Anyway, next one. Can I be ambitious and spiritual at the same time? Is it against Buddhism to be ambitious? If you, no, it's not going against Buddhism to be ambitious as long as it's a good ambition. And sometimes if the ambition is not so much for yourself, but something bigger than yourself, Right, you know, just uh, before when I tuned in again and saw Angie getting, uh, I thought it looked like a football, but apparently it was the Singaporean of the Year Award. And to do something good so that you can get uh, recognised or rather your goodness gets recognised. Because Angie never got that award. Her goodness got that award. And I got an, an Order of Australia. And it, not me, I don't get those awards. 
it is the, you know, all the good work which I've done that got the award. So the ambition is impersonal to do something good for a greater cause than yourself. So you work hard and you uh, try to make, whether it's the Buddhist Gem Fellowship, just you know, develop its top floor. And last time I was there, I said this will happen. And once you paid off what you own so far, or what you owed so far, you put something on top to actually extend it. You find out that whatever center you have, there's always you can build a bit more and develop it a bit more, which is wonderful because it makes it a good center for all the people who can't fit in at the moment and they will appreciate it later on. So the ambition in life is to make all beings be happy and well. And how can I help more beings in this world while I'm still alive? That's the best ambitious, impersonal. Obviously you have ambitions because of your duties to your family, you know, may my partner, my parents, my children, my brothers and sisters be well and happy. Ambition. But it's not personal. It's all about you. There's always something goes wrong there. If it's all about us, then that's a good ambition. Do imagine I have more sexual energy whenever I go on a retreat, maybe because of our less sensory stimulation. Help. It's watching porn, breaking of precepts. <laughs> I get some really interesting questions. And first of all, I thank you, whoever asks those questions, for not being afraid to ask them. Sometimes people feel a bit embarrassed about saying those things to a monk, but no, well done. So you have more sexual energy when you go on a retreat. Maybe at the beginning of the retreat, you may have some more sexual energy. If you can do some restraint of your body and mind, in other words, you know, when you start meditating, don't allow the thoughts to go on to sexual fantasies. Because if they do, they get even more sexual energy. The same I would imagine with watching porn. It just makes more sexual energy. It doesn't sort of satisfy it. It just makes it more interesting. You're just stirring it up more. So whenever you do have lots of sexual energy, that's when we start to do what we call the super meditations. That's where, you know, whatever gender you are, you look at you know, sexuality and be real with it. You know, it's great you know, when you're very young, but then after a while, you know, you, what's that for? The sexual energy is almost like your genes are almost forcing you into procreating and having progeny, having children. And you know, that's its purpose for you to, um, for your genes, your genetic code to be replicated. The, the genes wanting to, to um, reproduce and it makes use of you. I remember seeing this wonderful article on the chemistry of love. It was in a Time magazine many years ago. Now, I don't sort of uh, research these things, obviously, but the Time magazine had this little article which says when boy meets girl, it does not that boy loves the girl or the girl loves the boy. They put it very beautifully that the boy loves the way the girl makes them feel. And the girl loves the way the boy makes them feel. They get a sort of a sexual arousal in each other's company. And after a while, they said, just generally speaking, that if after a couple of years you don't have a kid, then a lot of times that sexual energy just wanes. It's almost uh, conditioned just to produce children. If you don't produce children, once you produce children, then the family gives you a boost of energy. You love the way the family makes you feel. And it's just the way that the hormones in the body create the, the happiness and pleasure in your body and mind. And we become prisoners of that. But obviously being a monk, you know, that when I was a young monk, obviously that first becoming a monk, great energy and no problems at all with sexual energy. But then later on, you know, he started to see some of the girls in the monastery, wow. But then he said, no, no, that's not going to help at all. I really love being a monk. But you know, you got stirred up with sexual energy, but I'd always look for the negative parts of the object which was arousing me. And I, to me, it was the pimples. I'd always see some pimples, some acne somewhere, something which would turn me off. And when I ever saw somebody I didn't like, something ugly, I'd always see something which I could like in that being. So I could balance that these are beings which are just human beings 
They have their beauty, they have their ugliness, they have their delight, they have the things which I don't like. And so you could actually have a sense of acceptance and peace with them. So, but it is true, it's probably because there's not so much sensory stimulation. And it's nice to be able to have sort of a bit of peace when you're meditating on a retreat. But someone once said that sometimes that you know, we have to go to hospitals or and we can't sort of have sexual relationships with our partner, or sometimes that they go overseas and we don't have relationships with them. And sometimes even just keeping the eight precepts and just being able to you know, have no sex for just a little time, it makes us much stronger so that when we come back again, you know, it's not such a, an obsession. Anyway, next one, similar subject. I have an excellent relationship with my husband. He still wants a girlfriend whom he can hug and kiss on the cheek. Though he doesn't sleep with her. Is that sexual misconduct? Yeah, it is, because what happens is after a while that the husband gets out of control. You're not just going to hug and kiss her on the cheeks. You know, after a while, just the, the lust, the hormonal pressure just takes over. So look, men and women as well, but mostly men, they feel they're in control of these emotions. But, you know, you ask men honestly, and they're not in control at all. They think they're only flirting. They're only just having a hug and a kiss. But, but when he says he wants a girlfriend, you can hug and kiss on the cheeks. It's just going to lead from one thing to another. That is my experience. It's very dangerous. So it's best not to do that. It's the same as the person who says they just want one glass of wine. There's one glass of alcohol, that's all, just one glass. There was an old poem, a very simple poem, which I read as a teenager. The man takes a drink, first line. Then the drink takes a drink, the second line. And the third line, then the drink takes a man. And instead of the drink, you say the girlfriend. The man takes a girlfriend, just the lust takes more lust, and eventually you end up sleeping together and creating a lot of problems in your life. So I think is is underestimating the power of lust and sexual attraction. Dear Ajahn, I only meditate when I feel good. Has been so for many years. How to not base practice on good feelings and practice even during bad times? <laughs> I meditate in order to feel good. Not because I already feel good. Like people go to the, when do people go to the hospital? When they get sick. Because the hospital heals the sicknesses. And it's the same with meditation. I've seen so many great benefits from meditation. But that's when I meditate, when I feel, especially when I feel really tired. I still remember just because talking about uh, all the friends and the times, good times I've had in Singapore and Malaysia. I remember when we used to have these big concerts. I forget which concert it was, but it was in one of the big auditoriums over in Singapore, Victoria Theatre, maybe, I'm not sure, but it doesn't matter. And I flew in from Perth, arrived just after lunch, straight to the venue, straight for the matinee performance. And you know, when you have to get up really early to catch the flight, you know, usually get up at least four o'clock in the morning, and straight to the airport and catch the flight and get to, to Singapore and then go through all the customs and then go straight to the airport just about. And then after that, I was really exhausted. And there's another performance that evening. I always remember this. I thought, I can't do this. It's just too tiring for me. But fortunately, all the rest of the cast, the Buddhist Fellowship, I think, who were running it at the time, they went off to get some, some dinner, something to eat. I couldn't do that, obviously. But then I found just a nice, quiet place in the theatre. It was actually, it was one of the, um, I think, the emergency exits which you, know, you couldn't open from the outside, from the outside, only from the inside. So I went right to the bottom of that. It was like in a nice little cave area. I sat down and meditated for about 45 minutes and that's all I needed. From exhaustion, you changed to having lots and lots of energy. You felt really as if you'd just woken up in the morning and full of energy. And I always remember that because it was important. I could be able to do this so I could perform and do my part to help out you know, the the Buddhism happening in Singapore. You know, I couldn't sort of let people down by being tired. And I knew how to bring up this great source of energy by meditating. So when I feel bad, I meditate. <laughs> and 
I know how to do it. Because if you don't feel good when you start meditating, sometimes you feel this is hopeless. But one thing which I, I ask you to develop is patience. You don't feel good maybe when you start meditating, be patient, just stay there. And after a while, it gets better and better and better. It's like the simile of, you know, you're going on a journey, you need to sit down somewhere, but you can't find a comfortable seat. So you find a, you know, a stone bench and it's cold and uneven. But you find the longer you stay on that cold bench, you start to warm it up. It starts to feel softer. And that's like my meditation. It might start uncomfortable, but when I'm patient with it, after a while, it becomes really, really nice and warm. And I start meditating, not really wanting to meditate because I don't feel so good. But by the end of the meditation, I feel fantastic. So try that, be patient, and you'll find the meditation brings much more happiness to you. Okay, the next question. The I is impermanent, perishing, and changing. Someone who has faith and confidence in these principles is called a follower by faith. They can't die without realizing the fruit of stream entry. This sounds very simple. Am I missing something? Yeah, of course. It is the faith element. You have to have such strong faith that what the Buddha said, you just do because the Buddha said it. And someone who is a following by faith, it's one of the two classes of those on the way to being a stream winner. If you're following by faith, you've got to be very careful because sometimes people can believe in the wrong things. You know, there are teachers around and they really look like they're good teachers and they, they say some ridiculous stuff. And you know, if I sell them off and say, no, you're not supposed to do that. They said, oh, Ajahn, Ajahn Brown would say that. What does he know? And it creates a sense of conflict in the Sangha. So it's really hard when you see people teaching the wrong thing because sometimes people follow that and it doesn't lead them to anywhere wonderful and good. It's one of the reasons why, you know, I, I inform many people, you never take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma and Ajahn Brahm. We never take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma and Ajahn Brahm, or the Buddha and the Dhamma and Ajahn Sumaita, or you don't take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma and Ajahn, Ajahn Chah. You take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. So you have a wide range of teachers and a big understanding of the suttas. But most importantly, what I said about the overcoming doubt, to know that what you're doing is going in the right direction. You can feel it's going in the right direction. So it's not just by faith, it's by experience. You practice, keep precepts. Is that making you happier? You're meditating, is that making you more peaceful? But are you becoming wise, not just wise so you can outwit people on a coffee table, but so that your life becomes more tranquil and meaningful. If it's going the right direction, then that is the path. So it's never just by being a faith follower. It's never really just by being a wisdom follower. It's like mostly faith and wisdom, or mostly wisdom and some faith. So we need all of those. And it means you have to practice. You go on retreats, you meditate, you keep your precepts, and you're a really nice, kind person. And that becomes a, a faith follower. If in the time of the Buddha, if you had so much faith in the Buddha, like some people did, the Buddha would just say, sit down and meditate, and they would do that. And would just sit down and watch your breath, and they could do it easily because they had so much confidence and faith in the teacher. But these days, that's very dangerous. You don't know what your teacher is, is saying. Anyway, next one. Hi, Ajahn Brahm. Hi. Could you explain the steps to attain the first path, first fruit for a lay person? Thank you. That's the same thing to being a stream winner. And the main part of being a stream winner is actually to see the non-self. So, you know, you have this identity, who you are, you know, whether you're Dato Victor Wee or Ajahn Brahm or Angie or whoever. And who is that? And sometimes when we misunderstand this thing which bears our name, then that stops us attaining a stream winner, being a stream winner. 
and it causes lots of suffering and much rebirth. But we actually see, and I'm sure that Ajahn Brahmadi said this in his Sutta classes for you, you see, it's, it's, you can't say there's nothing there, because you know, can hear me and you can think, you can know, you, can, you do stuff. There's something there, but you can't say it is a, a real thing because it's always changing, it's always in flux. So what is the center of this? Who actually are you? And the Buddha put it very beautifully. It was one of the middle ways. It's not middle way, it's not just the Eightfold Path. He also mentioned in Kachana Gota Sutta, the middle ways between being and non-being. And he called it it's like, a, like a, a process, I think is the best word. This moment causes the next moment, which causes the next moment, which causes the next moment. Causes and their effects. And when the causes stop, so do the effects, otherwise known as dependent origination. You may think that's a hard thing to see, but you know, sometimes you hear it and hear it and hear it, and sooner or later you see it and think, wow, this is what I took to be a permanent self. It's not permanent, it's not nothing, this is process. Because it's a process, cause and effect. When the causes stop, so does the effect. So this person who bore your name has a cessation. When it ceases, nothing's left, it just causes. So it's subject to cessation. And you might find that all those people you read about in the suttas, when they attained to the stream winning, that's actually how they described it. All the has a cause, the Buddha's explained. And when that cause finishes, so do the effects. You see this what this life really is. Some people get afraid of that and they think that's annihilation. Not annihilation, nothing was annihilated. And just to make the last bit of this, because I was talking about this today with a few people, it's that, you know, because I was a physicist before, and I'm not going into deep physics, but you know that it was the New Zealand physicist Rutherford split the atom many hundred, no, oh, hundred and something years ago, I think. But before he split the atom, the Buddha split the atma, the sense of self. Because the atom was supposed to be the indivisible, essential, permanent particle of stuff, of nature. You've got atoms, and they make molecules and different elements. But then the atom was supposed to be the indivisible. It actually means in ancient Greek, indivisible. And it was actually quite staggering for someone to be able to split that and find it's not indivisible. And that this atom, which makes up stuff, is just other causes brings it into existence. When those causes vanish, so does the atom. The same with the atma, the sense of self, which we assume to be permanent. We find it's just a bunch of causes coming together, which creates the thing we, you, which bears your name. When those causes are take, taken away, when you become very peaceful and very still, when you let go, you disappear. Okay, next question. Hi Ajahn, correct me if I'm wrong. Nah, I won't correct you. I'll just give another idea. In your previous talk, you mentioned that time is circular. Ah, oh, okay, this one. Can you elaborate on how this works? Does it mean events and calm will repeat again and again? How does it apply to those enlightened? Thank you. Okay, now this again, it's just like I was mentioning earlier, that the law of gravity, what goes up comes down. Now, when you're teaching a kid, that's obvious. They throw something up and it always comes down. Unless it gets stuck in a tree or something, but they know it will come down. But if you throw it up fast enough, like a rocket, you know, it leaves the Earth's gravitational field and never come back. So you see that some of these things which we talk about, they just, you start with something which is easy for people to understand, and then you work on that to make it more accurate, but it's also more complicated. So time is circular. How does this work? You think, well, I can come back again to the time and redo it. No, the idea that time is circular is pretty accurate, but the idea that you, 
can go round and round and round, is the error which people make. And the only way I can describe this is just like with our universe being circular. It's circular, I mean, it's like curved in time. So our universe has no edges to it. So, you know, you could think you can go in one direction and come back to where you started again. But the point is that on the journey, this universe is always expanding. And so as it expands, the distance gets even further away. In theory, it seems that you can get to the end and come back again. But as you're going, where you started from gets further away. These are the weird things about our universe, which is one of the reasons why as a theoretical physicist, sometimes it's very hard to explain it to others. So time is the same. Time is sense circular, but you can't actually do one whole circle. It just keeps on expanding. Durations change. But the idea is circular. I was just recently, so Roger Penrose, who I had the delight to meet many years ago uh, when he came to Perth. He was the one who invented black holes. He did the maths behind black holes. And it was Stephen Hawkins who turned it upside down and made it the beginning of the universe. Not what ends things, but what begins things. But even Stephen Hawkins, Professor Hawkins would say that, no, it's just the Big Bang wasn't the start. There was something before the Big Bang. And now even Professor Penrose, he just won the Nobel Prize for Physics this year. And you know, he was just now talking about this evidence to show that there is, he called it scars left from the previous universe before the Big Bang. So and even someone like him is admitting that the Big Bang didn't start the universe. It was a universe before the Big Bang. And so it does go around. You can't go from this universe to the last universe physically, although you can in your mind. The Buddha would say that he remembered many, many eons of existence. In other words, many universes. The body would get destroyed between universes and all matter will get messed up. But the mind is something which can transcend that. Anyway, that's all interesting stuff. And that's why I get really inspired. Maybe I'm biased because I'm a Buddhist. But I get really inspired in my physics part of my brain, starts getting inspired by how the Buddha described universe after universe, and just how the mind can actually know these different universes. That's a huge mind to know those things. Anyway, anyway, uh, yeah. How does it apply to those in light? In light is you just get out of time, so it disappears. Time carries on for others, but for you it's gone. Now I get some nice questions, get my science mind going. Dear Ajahn Bama, I've been practicing meta meditation. Now this is more emotional. Sometimes when we talk about science, it gets too intellectual. Meta meditation, this is emotional. And emotions, quite frankly, are more important for your life and also for getting deep meditation. I mentioned this before, that the way into deep meditation is an emotional journey, not an intellectual journey. You feel your way in. You can feel this is going in the right direction. If you start thinking, it's endless. I've been practicing meta meditation daily for years and we pass them occasionally. Although it has brought me calm and confidence to get by the challenge of each day, should I prioritize we pass the meditation instead? No. Keep on doing your meta meditation. And there comes a time the meta meditation, you just really hit the sweet spot of meta meditation. You get so peaceful. Then what to do is, I call it like disembodied meditation. That's right, disembody meta meditation. Don't say, may this being be happy and well, or even may all beings be happy and well. But you have meta, the essence of meta, without applying it to anyone. Disembodied meta. You're not giving it to yourself, you're not giving it to anybody, it's just there. It's just the power of loving kindness. Once you have the power of loving kindness, you stay with that. It's such a beautiful object to focus on. It will attract you if you let it. And that meta, it, uh, please, I know this is the same old stuff, but this is what happens. 
it turns into a nimeter. See this beautiful golden light. And I don't know why, but it, for most people, it's always this beautiful gold, incredibly powerful golden light, full of energy, full of joy, full of happiness. It's pure. And that metta, very quickly, very usually very easy, takes you into a jhana. And then the metta is the way to a jhana. So that's what I would do. If you're doing metta meditation daily, I'd just carry on. And then after you come out of the jhanas, then you have the energy. The five hindrances are just gone for a while. Then you can do vipassana. Then you can understand things. You've got a powerful mind. And not only a powerful mind, you've got this incredible data of what it's like you know, to be free from this body in this deep jhanas. That's how the Buddha became enlightened. And that's how I encourage each one of you. Okay, next question. I can't see any questions. Maybe everyone's enlightened. Oh no, never mind. It was a good hope. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, my mom has been verbally abusing me, but recently has reached my limit. How do I protect myself mentally without feeling guilty? Are there any Buddhist teachings that I could read to understand more to help myself? Thanks, Ajahn. Uh, verbally abusing you, that's not so bad. It's your mother. I don't know why she's verbally abusing you. And now, is your mother sick or is she just, is it a plea for help because you know, she is upset about something? A lot of times, if it's someone close to you, like a mother or father or husband, wife or something, a lot of times it is not she's abusing you, but her sickness is abusing you. you know, she's desperate, she's unwell, or she's, she's depressed. And never think it's your mum doing it. Think it's her sickness which is abusing you. And that means that because you know your mum, hopefully she was this beautiful person who brought you into the world and loved you and cared for you. And what I would do is, uh, if she abuses you, in one ear, out the other. And just, if you can, ignore it. If it's physically abusing you, then just leave the room, protect your body. And then when she says something nice to you, they always do something nice sometimes, then just really look at her, smile and say, thank you, mum. So you're verbally reinforcing her good behaviour and you're ignoring her bad behavior. And I know that's very hard to do sometimes because you know, you're know you hurting. But if you can see it's not really your mom doing this, I'm not sure why she's doing this, there's some sickness in her brain or whatever. And when she does some good things to you, then to say, oh, thank you, mother, so nice of you to say that. And then you find actually you're reinforcing her good behavior. She gets basically rewarded you know, when she gets talks to you appropriately. If he talks to you inappropriately, then of course you leave. I don't know if you live with her, but you know, sometimes it's nice when a person is abusive like that to get your own apartment or flat or something. So that you know you can have some peace by yourself. And whatever she says, don't take that as a personal criticism. Which is your mother is a, just a bit sort of sick. Because real people we don't abuse people like that no, unless we're somehow sick or we're not seeing things properly or it's a plea for help. For most people, we're just kind to one another. Why not be kind? Anyway, dear Ajahn Brahm, can you explain, can you please explain on Sila Bhatta Paramasa? Like, yeah, that's right. My understanding is it is the adherence to rites and rituals. However, another teacher said it's inconsistent keeping of the five precepts. Thank you, Ajahn. <laughs> now, the Siddhapata Paramasa is actually having the idea that you are doing, say, precepts, that's Sila or duties, but that's all you need to do to become a stream winner. In other words, keeping precepts and doing duties are important. You know, I keep my precepts and I I love my precepts. You can't say I'm attached to my precepts. There are some things which are worth being attached to. As you've heard me say before, 
if you're on a motorbike, the back seat of a motorbike, not the driver, on the back of a motorbike, and you're going down the road, please be attached. Don't sort of let go while the motorbike is still going down the road, otherwise you'll injure yourself. Some attachments are very helpful and useful. Some duties are very useful. You, you do your duties of paying your taxes. You do your duties in Singapore of like, or exercising. So, you know, when you get your annual checkup you know, for the army or whatever, you know, you're fit enough and you don't have to do many more. So duties are important, but it's just learning just how to put them in perspective. That by keeping precepts and doing your duties, that's important, but it's not enough. And to become a stream winner, he also needs to do some study of the Dhamma, to learn it, and from a good teacher. It's what we call Paratagosa. It's learning from a good teacher, usually an Aryan. And also um, doing your meditation as well. You never emphasize the power of meditation. You don't get enlightened just by studying. You get enlightened by overcoming the five hindrances and then having the deep understanding of the nature of these five candors, the body and the mind. Anyway, is experience only peace and calm in meditation? Isn't useful and or lead to gain insights? Body and mind start to be restless when I try to focus on breath. If peace and calm is all I can do, would this be helpful in clarity at my deathbed? Ah, flashes nimitta. Okay. It's nice, actually. This is how people send text messages with ends. And so I think I interpret it correctly because I'm an old muck now. So anyway, hopefully that's correct, what I said. And peace and calm in meditation, you can't just experience peace and calm in meditation. If you've got peace and calm in meditation, real peace and calm, your insight increases, your mindfulness increases. So if you're going for peace and calm, really go for it. Have a really deep peace and amazing calm in meditation. And afterwards, you get little you know, uh, byproducts like good health, and you get byproducts of being more efficient in your workplace. You can do more without getting stressed out. This, you know, sometimes, to be quite honest, look at the monks in my monastery. We work very hard we, and we're very efficient. We achieve so much. At the same time, we can do lots of meditation, be calm and happy. It's a very pleasant living in Bodhinyana Monastery, chatting with the monks and telling jokes and messing around. And we have a wonderful time. But we also do heaps of meditation. We do a lot of work as well, and writing books and goodness knows what else. So and it proves that you can have karma meditation and it, it just goes into many, 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 many more parts of our life. And it, it does lead to insights. That's how the Buddha became enlightened, getting into the jhanas under the tree and then wham, 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 seeing dependent origination, karma, the whole works, Four Noble Truths. So body and mind start to be restless when I try to focus on the breath. Now this is a problem here that you don't, to be calm, and peaceful, you don't focus on the breath. Calm and peace first of all, let the breath come to you. Just a general observation, the way that people meditate in today, today's world. They try and focus on the breath way too early. The mind is never peaceful enough or strong enough to actually to watch the breath. And that means that they try to do it and the mind rebels and you just go wandering off and you're restless. So it never happens to me because I create peace and calm in my mind, first of all. Relax my body, peaceometer, and I get into the present moment awareness and the silence. I stay there long enough and breath comes to me. I never go looking for the breath. I never, I never ever try to focus on the breath. I try to do nothing. That's called calm. When you try to do something, you're destroying the peace. You're destroying the calm. You just let go. Just be the passive observer, relaxing, making sure you don't interfere with things. The simile is what I read in an Air Asia magazine once when I was traveling 
and in the Air Asia magazine, some pilot was writing an article on what he thought would be the aircraft of the future. And in the aircraft of the future, he said, in the cockpit, there would only be two beings in the cockpit, a pilot and his dog. I love this simile. And the pilot and the dog would be all to be in the cockpit of modern aircraft in the future, he said. And the job of the pilot in the cockpit would be to feed the dog. That's his only job, to feed the dog. Not to fly the plane, the plane would be automatic. So the pilot would be there to feed the dog and the dog would be there, highly trained dog, to bite the captain if he tried to touch something. In other words, they need somebody up there to make the passengers feel safe, that's all. But the pilot could not do anything. The dog would bite him if he tried to do something. And I thought, what a beautiful simile that is of successful meditation. If there was some means I could put a dog in people's minds, and when you start, if you try to watch the breath bite you, to stop you, and instead just be in this moment, be a silent mind and let all these things come to you. In other words, for you to let go, let things be. Okay, next question. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and can't fall asleep again. Besides meditation, what other ways do you have to have a good night's sleep? Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. Loving kindness is the best. So may all beings be happy and well, including me. And, uh, what other things can you do? Make sure you lessen your coffee intake or tea intake or whatever else. So at least you're not stoked up on caffeine in the night, middle of the night or before you go to sleep. And also to make sure you're physically comfortable. Because this is one of my personal problems. I'll let you all know my personal problems. If the, if the room is too hot, I find it really difficult to fall asleep. Too cold, I can always put on another blanket, but too hot. And just my body just stays awake. It's one of the reasons why the people over in, uh, especially in Indonesia, when I go on tours over there teaching, oh, some of the air conditioned rooms, the air conditioner doesn't work. <laughs> oh, and they, they, you know, it just doesn't go down low enough. And so I find it difficult to fall asleep. But nevertheless, you know, you survive. But make sure it's physically comfortable for you and quiet. And then you find you need physical comfort. I think the, the older you are, the more physical comfort you need to go to sleep. But then there is another way. And that is when I lay down, and if I really need a good night's sleep, I lay down and I say, this is my sleep time. And I'm not going to think of any problems or difficulties, anxieties, things I have to do tomorrow morning. I'm not even going to think about it. I train my mind to let go of the future. And if you train your mind to let go of the future, you can usually have a lovely night's sleep. Of course, you let go of the past as well. But letting go of those two things, the past and the future, is freeing your mind of its burdens. So when you go to sleep, you can have a good night's sleep. And one way you can do that, which I've taught many other people, you know, people use their, their slippers in their house. So they go into their bedroom in their slippers, not in their boots or not barefoot. You put your two slippers under your mattress, under your bed. And when you take off the left shoe or the left slipper, call that the past. And you're taking off the past, the left slipper. And then you take off the right slipper, that's your future. Just call them past and future. And you put your past and future under your bed. And you call them that. And then you get under the mattress, not under the mattress, sorry, <laughs> under, the, under the blanket. You have to be crazy to sleep under the mattress. <laughs> there we go. You get under the, the, uh, the uh, blanket, put your head on the pillow, and you've left your slippers underneath the bed for you in the morning. You don't take those slippers into bed with you. And that really helps you have a good night's sleep. Oh, Jim, oh, <laughs> the Kalama Sutra again. 
You know, sometimes what we say about the Kalama Sutta, we get an adjective from the Kalama Sutta, the Calamity Sutta. <laughs> Someone's laughing at that, PJ. Don't say Ajahn Bamadi, otherwise I'll get into more trouble. Ajahn Bamadi Sutta study sessions have provided me a new perspective on how to read and study suttas regarding the Calamity Sutta. <laughs> The last part of the four assurances. I hope Ajahn Brahm Ajahn can elaborate further on his four assurances. Thank you. Yeah, Ajahn Brahm can do that. That's his job. So I pass the buck. Dear Ajahn, is it being gay due to my bad karma? No. Also, how do I overcome my fear of coming out and stigmatization? It's a crime, it's a crime to be gay in Malaysia. That's terrible. I only wish to love and live like any other human being. And you've got a right to do that. Thank you. It's I mean, in Singapore. I don't think it's a crime to be gay in Singapore, I think, hopefully. So if that's the case, just move over to Singapore. And I don't know why that's the case in Malaysia. It's not a crime at all. You've got, look, you know this, whoever wrote this question, you've got no choice. You know, you are gay. You can't sort of have what they call conversion therapy, which has been, that's illegal now. In a place like I think Australia, they made that illegal not so long ago. Conversion therapy. Just the people who do that go to, to be actively gay. What does it mean actively gay? Anyway, but in most modern worlds, modern societies, in Europe, United States, many other places, people know that being a gay person is not a choice. So if you have a choice, then maybe that can be legal and illegal, but because it's not a choice, a person is born gay and they are gay, and you can't do anything about it. And to say to a gay person, you know, just don't, don't be who you are, that is really, that's cruel. That is so uncivilized. And if religions start thinking about that, the religions are not smart at all. They're not civilized religions. In Buddhism, there's nothing wrong with being gay. In the Hindu tradition, there was nothing wrong with being gay. And if that's who you are, it's like you're a woman. Imagine if you're a woman and said you can't be a, uh, uh, an active woman. <laughs> No, you can't do that. I mean, that's ridiculous. It's just meaningless. And it's really a shame that so many gay people in the world have been abused and they fought for their rights. At least in some countries, you have those rights and freedoms. So the only thing I can actually say is that please move to one of those countries like Australia, where you're respected and loved and have the freedom to enjoy yourself as you are. And have relationships, gay relationships, and have a wonderful time together. Why not? So anyway, I feel for you. I was never gay. I was heterosexual. I had girlfriends when I was young. But then, of course, as a, a religious leader, you see all these problems and think, oh, why are people doing this? Over here in Australia, we started a, a gay Buddhist society not so long ago called Rain Bodhi. You know, the rainbow became like a symbol of the gay community here in Australia. And Rain Bodhi was like a Buddhist um, gay community. And they're doing wonderful well. They had their first anniversary this year. And they're doing wonderful well to say they're very proud to, you know, to be Buddhist and be gay. <laughs> Why not? So I really feel for you. I mean, if somehow or other you can eventually, after COVID is finished and plan to come to places like Australia and then later on maybe Malaysia will change. Anyway, hi Ajahn, if, if it's not your bad karma, it's just who you are. Hi Ajahn, if we are reincarnate and Buddha said not easy to become a human, why does the human population keep increasing in the world? Well the human population does keep in, increasing in the world, but it's not my fault. I'm a monk, I haven't had kids, so I, I'm innocent. But, the, but it is increasing in the world, so it is easier to get a birth as a human being than it was in the time of the Buddha. There are more rooms in the hotel. 
so you can actually book a room in the human hotel. And of course, when people say, oh, that just proves reincarnation is nonsense. Where did all these human beings come from? And the answer is really quite obvious. It came from the animal realm. There's so few so, you know, things like gorillas and chimpanzees and all these higher primates. And we're just a primate, a primate which can, can uh, speak and can say bad things about gays. I don't think that gorillas do that. So who's the highest? So anyway, that um, because there's, uh, there's many animals have lost their habitat, that's why many animals are now being reborn as humans. Which explains you know, many of these really stupid people and violent people. <laughs> there were animals before. Anyway, is a white lie okay? Okay, the story behind that, my, this common question. You know, one of my disciples, this old English man, he's this, and when he had sort of a heart attack, it's quite a few years ago now put in hospital and just waiting for a bypass surgery. And in one of these old wards with three other male people in the same ward. So of course they spent all day together lying in these beds, talking about all sorts of stuff. They became friends. And the, one of his friends was having a bypass the day before he was due to have the bypass. And that night, the night before this man, this Buddhist, was going to have a bypass operation, his wife called me at monastery. She was really upset. She said, I lied to my husband when I saw him this afternoon. She said, it's the first time I've lied to him in about 37 years, she said. We've always been honest together. We're both Buddhists, but I lied to him and I feel terrible about it. What did you say? I said, she said, his friend who had the heart bypass operation today, he died. The complications with the operation. And I saw the family outside the hospital. They were crying and moaning because they were just so devastated. Then I went in to see my husband and my husband asked, how did he do today? I lied. I said, he survived. He's in the ICU. No trouble. Because she said, if I tell my husband the truth, then he may have got so afraid and may have killed him. And you know, he did just was on the edge for many days the bypass operation, this old man, Dave, and he survived in the end, but only just. And I said to her that that's probably one case where a white lie was okay. Because that lie, not telling your husband that his friend had died from an operation he was going to have the following morning, probably saved his life. And so I tell many people now, it's okay to say a white lie once every 37 years, but no more. <laughs> so it's not an excuse. Okay, uh, it's almost a toilet break. So I have this question, then we have a toilet break. Going with the phone break, I think that's about right. Do I remember what is the meaning of Nibbida? Thank you. Nibbida is saying that your word working in a pub, and serving alcohol, you think it's a lovely career and you're getting lots of money, but after all, I say, what am I doing this for? You know, this is like serving alcohol and just people doing all sorts of crazy things and people are coming in here, you know, with their mistresses and girlfriends and not really their wives and women are coming in here and they should be at home with their husband and just, what am I doing this for? And Nibida comes up as a sense So for real, I said, what you doing is really nasty and I don't want to do this anymore. So this is actually where the Nibida, I call it samsara's, you know, the wheel of uh, rebirth, the wheel of suffering, samsara's ejection seat. Now it pushes you off. You see, you say, oh, this is ridiculous what I'm doing. And it pushes you off to seek a better existence, a better career, a better life. Somebody do need something a bit more, uh, forceful than just now uh, wisdom. It's the wisdom which actually pushes you to do a better thing, a better life. That's called Nibida. Okay, so well, that went quickly an hour. So now we can have toilet break and then 
uh, we can come back and we can have the last 25 minutes of questions. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So off you go. The toilet seats await you. And usually when you have to go, go the first place that gets the first seat. So be fast on your marks, get set, go. <laughs> Thanks for those great questions. I see some of the other questions here, some interesting ones about fortune tellers. My advice to anyone who has problems with fortune tellers is never trust a poor fortune teller. If the fortune teller is not wealthy, they can't tell their own fortune. Whose fortune can they tell? So he said, this woman would only live to 75. <laughs> if he can guarantee that, so what if she lives to over 75? Will you pay us a million dollars? If he's really sure about it, then why not? But of course, no one knows the future. The future is always work in progress. No one knows what will happen. So fortune tellers who say such things, uh, most of the time, they don't know really what they're talking about. Even doctors, they sometimes say you've only got a few days to live. But even doctors, you know, they say when so you go to a person and say, I've only got a few days to live. And you tell the, the doctor, say, well, I don't think I can pay your bills in just one week. So, okay, I'll give you two weeks to live then. That's an old joke. <laughs> or the doctor, I'm just telling a few silly stories while we're waiting for people to come back from toilet. Or the doctor who told the gentleman, he said, you know, you're very, very sick. Uh, I got muffled sound. If you uh, get very, very sick, and the doctor said to him, "I'm sorry, sir, but your cancer is terminal." And he said, "How many? How much time have I got to live?" And the doctor says, "Ten. Ten what? Ten years? Ten months? Ten days?" The doctor continued, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> And please forgive me, or please don't forgive me, I understand. If you tell jokes about such things, it's all wonderful. Simply because people can take life and death so seriously. Oh, marvelous. At Brahm Center, 10% of our staff are LGBT. Singapore is much more open to LGBT. Yeah, well done. I'm proud of you, Brahm Center. To give people just respect and give people an opportunity just to be themselves and give people the time, the opportunity to have a good work environment where they feel respected and valued. They don't have to hide who they are. That's wonderful. And quite frankly, again, I'm a heterosexual, but I'm a Buddhist. I, I just can't get it why people are afraid of gay people and lesbians and LGBTQIA+, plus. many, many different uh, types of people make up our world. And you know, all notice, oh, some of the, the people who are gay are amazing people. You know, people like Tchaikovsky, always loved his music. And Elton John, and I don't know, goodness knows however, who was that? Uh, I only heard that story some time ago about um, Alan Trick, the mathematical genius and you know, cracked the Enigma code and saved Britain you know, from being overrun during the Second World War. He was gay. So, Alan Turing, yeah. So, that he was an amazing fellow, he was gay. And uh, he was basically a hero of UK. And actually the Allies during that Second World War. And you can see what happened to during that Second World War, if you were Jewish, you know, the, the people tried to eliminate you because you were Jewish. It was crazy. Now people try to eliminate people or suppress people because they're gay, lesbian, transgender. 
Let's, let's, um, genderist, like racist, and people be so ashamed of our leaders for permitting that uh, in this age. Okay, there's uh, another question. Okay, because it'll be 8.35. Are people back from the toilets yet? Yes, you can go ahead. Okay, great. Hi, Ajahn. Thanks for the beautiful guided meditation. My spouse has com had committed suicide due to depression three years ago. Since then, my see, see, hey, children and, and I were still in shock and feeling remorseful about her sudden departure. What can I do as a Buddhist? Please help. Okay. When you think about your wife who committed suicide, uh, first of all, don't just think how she ended her life. Think how she lived her life. Why is it that sometimes people do an intense act like a suicide, and that is all we remember about their life. You know, she did some wonderful things in life. You know, you got, fell in love and got married, and you had kids. And, you know, that woman was just such wonderful memories you have of her. Why do we not even think of those good memories and just think about the way she ended her life? And the story behind that, which I found very affected, was the one range retreat, the Sri Lankan family came, they rang, so we need a strange retreat. I meditated, said, no, we really need to see it because we woke up this morning and found our 17-year-old son on the end of a rope. He committed suicide in the front porch of our house. And they were devastated. Now, obviously, so I found time and they came and I talked to them and they were just, you know, almost like crazy. And then I told them, look, this is your son. And it was before he's about to do his end of the year exams. And I asked him, how many subjects was he going to take? He said, about five subjects. How many papers in each exam? Maybe two. That's 10 exams he had to sit. How many questions in each exam paper? They didn't know where I was going with this, but they were respectful enough to follow me. Say maybe average eight questions. I said, well, five papers, two exams in each paper, eight questions. That's 80 questions. What would have happened, I asked him, if... He answered 79 questions perfectly. And the last question in the paper, he made a big mess of. Would he still go to university? He said, yes, 79 out of 80 is a really good score. I said, why are you so ashamed? He was a beautiful son, he did so much goodness. But his last question, he really blew the last question and killed himself. Still 79 out of 80 is a pretty good score. You'd be very happy that he was your son and you lived a wonderful life. Don't judge a person by the way they die. Judge them by the way they live. And that's the same as you know, your spouse who passed away. Why people commit suicide is never usually a good idea. But nevertheless, they did so many more things in life. Remember them for those good things they did in life, not just the way they died. Next question, how do we overcome the grief of the passing of loved ones? Would we be able to meet them again in our next lives? Yes, yeah, sometimes you do. But there was, I remember the story of up in heaven somewhere, the, the husband had died first and the wife you know, died a couple of years later and she went looking for him. And then when she found him, he chased her away. He said, why are you chasing me away? We were married before. He said, yeah, don't you remember till death us do part? We're dead, so we part, okay? That was the deal. <laughs> That's one of those silly jokes I keep remembering. But the grief of passing of our loved ones. I don't know my, uh, I can't say these things, previous spies, but when my father died, I had no grief. Weird. I was only 16 years of age. I wasn't, a, well, I was a Buddhist, but I didn't realize it. And he passed away at home. And I never cried, never felt like crying. And the emotion I felt at the time, I understood later on when I became a monk, the emotion I felt was one of just, peace, excuse me, joy. What a wonderful father that was. And how lucky I was to have had him for all those years, 16 years. How could I be sad at that? I saw his whole life, not just his death. And I felt so beautiful about that. 
Of course, I would have loved to have 20 years, 50 years. Sometimes I wonder what he'd be like now seeing me as a monk. And I'm sure he'd just love me as usual. So he's a wonderful father and I valued him so much. For the 16 years, I would never give that up. Thank you for those 16 years. And it became the simile of the concert. The end of a concert, all concerts end. So when the concerts end, you never feel grief that the concert's over. You always shout and clap and shout for more. And then you go away thinking what a wonderful performance that was. How lucky I was to have been there at the time. And that's what I had with the death of you know, my father and the death of anyone these days. How wonderful it was to have known you for all those years. How can I feel sad? And it was a pleasure and a benefit and a privilege to have been your friend. That overcomes all grief. And it sees life and death in a much more positive and realistic way. When it's grief, you're just thinking of you know, what you've lost. When it's respect and gratitude, you're thinking what you've had. Anyway, next question. Hi, I had experienced this depressive mood past month with no motivation to work. I had no interest in life for more than a month. Felt depressed and meaningless. I could not do anything. Mind was dull. How to make sure not to repeat next time and not waste time. <laughs> it's sometimes a depression. You dig your own hole of depression. And once you're in the bottom of that hole, it's very hard to come out. You got out. Well done. So know the signs of depression. Know that you know, you're getting a little bit lazy, you've got no motivation to work, nothing is really firing you up. And you can catch it earlier and earlier because you know, there comes a time when depression is just so strong it's got you. Like the snake has wound around you and it's really hard to get out of that. You can see the snake when it's not, not even actually touched you yet, you can walk away, it doesn't hurt you. So that's one of the things, no depression, know it well. And when you see it at a distance, then avoid it. Don't think you're in control and you can handle it when it's right around you. You have to handle it earlier. And also you have your, what we call the strategies. If you are someone who's a subject to depression, in other words, it's happened many times, you know it's a danger to you then have you know, your favorite things to actually overcome depression. Hopefully it could be things like some of my talks or meditation. You know, when you feel a bit down, get those talks out, listen to them and just uh, recalibrate you know, your, your happiness level. Find things which make you happy. Get a dog or a cat or something and they can really sort of cheer you up or just you know, get some good books or even music, which you really like. So get the things which actually inspire you. And before you get into the bottom of that hole, depression, and that sometimes they don't work when you're right in the bottom. When you're going down, get those things out and then you don't go to the bottom of the pit and you can come up pretty easily. Next question. Dear Ajahn, during my previous retreat while meditating with my eyes open, I suddenly lost perception of space and everything appeared to be 2D as I was looking through a kaleidoscope. Could you please explain this phenomena? Thanks. I always close my eyes when I'm meditating, but I think what happened, even though your eyes were opened, because what you were seeing was probably not moving, nothing was moving, then what happens is that the sense of sight turns off in with your eyes open. Because remember that experience which I tell many people about when I was a student and I went to this Zen monastery to do a retreat. It's the only one which I could go to at the time. And they told me to meditate with my eyes open, which I did. But I was looking at a whitewashed wall in an old barn in the north of England. But I was, you know, I was obedient enough and interested enough to try something new that I did that. With my eyes open, I was watching a wall. And after about half an hour, the wall vanished. That was so cool. There's a wall there, now there was nothing. And I was young and confident enough, I wasn't scared. And I realized later on, this is just what the, the mind or what the brain does. If nothing is happening with sight, 
It's just you're seeing the same white wall and it's not interesting, nothing is moving, it vanishes. It's just the same as the ambient sound in the background and maybe traffic. If it doesn't really change that much, it disappears. You may hear the air con in the room you're in if you're lucky enough to have one. And then after a while, you don't hear it anymore because your brain is very efficient. It's been, uh, what's it called, evolved to only notice changes. And things which are constant, it just can't perceive. So that might be what happened there. Because what you were watching in that retreat was not changing, the ordinary sense of sight turned off. And what you may have been watching was almost like a half an imiter experience, 2D and weird. Anyway, let's try another question. Should someone with diminished quality of life still retrieve receive treatment for chronic illnesses. If there is a discriminant in the family on this, this causes a lot of stress. And I would say that it depends where you are. If the treatment of chronic illness is really, really, really expensive and call, up, cause other people to be ill, then there may be a, an argument. But usually, as Buddhists, we say, may all beings be happy and well. And so we don't discriminate because if someone has diminished quality of life, they're still alive. They still need kindness and sort of treatment. So I think as a Buddhist, we're far more willing to actually to give that treatment and the kindness if the person wants it, no matter who they are, no matter what they are. Say, so, well, you know, you've got diminished quality of life, but you're still alive and we respect that. So, you know, we want you to live as best you possibly can. Ajahn. Would it help by charting the Ratana Sutta at this pandemic time? Thank you. You can give it a try. If it's you and you have faith in the Ratana Sutta, then it works. Just like now if you, if Singapore are playing Malaysia in soccer, and then if you're a Singaporean and you chant for them, you scream for them, and the Malaysians, they don't say anything at all, would that help the Singaporean play a better game? Of course they would. So sometimes chanting is a way that we can almost like believe that our energy is actually doing something and it works. So it works, but there's so much more to do than just chant the rat and the sutta. Take the vaccine, wear the masks, uh, take social distancing, and then chant the meta sutta as well, or the rat and the sutta. Next question, if there is one. Wow, have I run out of questions? No. Hi, Ajahn Donut. Ah, oh, that's so nice. You remember my real name. You know, there's, sometimes people like to respect monks, especially senior monks, but sometimes we get too much respect. And sometimes I like a little bit of familiarity because I've known so many of you and your friends. And if you give too much respect to a monk, they become entitled. They become so entitled that they expect to be treated like royalty. And you, know, you, they, you can't ask questions to them because you think that's gonna be uh, bad karma to ask a question you know, about to a senior monk. And I've seen so many entitled monks in the sense of you know, they, they will not answer your questions. And they will not sort of you know, come down and meet you. And I think that's a terrible situation for Buddhism. And even in the time of the Buddha, sometimes the Buddha would walk alone from place to place, even though he's invited and very famous. And when he would walk alone, sometimes he would meet people and talk to them, didn't know who he was. So he did not have any airs or graces. He was just a monk. And that was the most important epithet for him, just a monk even though he was the, the great Lord Buddha. So I always keep that in mind so that we don't get too, um, too so I suppose, sucked in to all the wonderful things people say about us. Dear Ajahn Dona, there's something I'm struggling with. These days we hear so many leaders who abuse their rights. Oh, they're just talking about that. It gets really tough trying to stay good when there's so much darkness in humanity these days. Any insight, many thanks. 
it's please excuse me but i used to say that politicians are like children's nappies they need to be changed regularly <laughs> and the reason is because it's you see really good people become politicians they were good when they start but you know the power corrupts it's a very old saying by lord acton power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely there's nothing wrong with a person who has that power or they think is absolute power it just corrupts them if they're not strong and one of the reasons why in democracies it's good you know not to have a leader who is just there for too long let them serve the society let them serve their country and let them bow out having done their service and don't think that now they've been there for such a long time they know how to run the country sometimes they think like that but you know they need a new pair of hands fresh ideas clean hands to be able to look after the place and so many leaders that's the case that they they lead for too long and their great legacy and service get tainted by the length of time they're in that role children's nappies like politicians need to be changed regularly next question is amitabha pure land in our milky way no that's it that's my answer <laughs> dear ajahn would it be wiser not to tell an aging person that he has cancer telling them to the truth will make them give up hope and accelerate their death hey why because cancer is an, is a word not a sentence so many people have had cancer and they recover so cancer is you know, it's not like telling a person you're going to die so people have that fear of cancer so why don't be honest to the old person and saying oh yeah you got cancer but you know that many old people they survive their cancer and they're fine oh, i can't resist this story there was good old ted you know he was a really nice old man from from uh, lancashire and uh, he got his cancer and it was so bad that eventually went to the hospice we have these hospices where people go there to die so they don't expect to to go out of the hospice except in a box they admitted to the hospice bad cancer and in the hospice you only have palliative care no other words you know to make sure that you don't have too much pain and stress and you can have a wonderful last few days of your life so good old ted went into the hospice and the first night in the hospice the nurse came up and said okay ted you know what do you want to have for dinner tonight and ted said well i got diabetes so i can't have anything sugary or sweet i've got high cholesterol so i can't have anything oily or greasy I've got hardened arteries, so I can't have anything salty. And he went on like this. And the nurse was looking at him and said, Ted, what on earth are you talking about? You're not going to die of diabetes or heart attack or hardened arteries. You've got cancer. You're going to die in a few days from cancer. Nothing else is going to kill you, just the cancer. Ted, you can eat anything you want. And Ted's eyes went wide. He told me this story. It's a funny story. His eyes went wide. What you mean I can eat all the greasy, salty, sweety food which my wife has never allowed me to eat in the last 10 years? Yeah, Ted, you can have whatever you want. So Ted ordered this really greasy, salty, oily, sugary sweets afterwards. And he really enjoyed the food so much. And this is no exaggeration. After six days, he walked under his own power out of the hospice because his cancer went into remission and, <laughs> and six days later oh no, six months later he went back to the hospice to die properly but he had six months because of the joy and happiness in his body eating you know, healthy food it certainly gave him a six months of extra life i love that story because it's confronting and it tells us that there's more to health than just what we eat. It's the joy in our life. 
is also important. Okay, dear Ajahn, on daily basis, what are the most important Dharma teachings we should contemplate on? <laughs> well, you get up in the morning, another lovely day, you know, it may not be your last day, so impermanence, and the fact that it's really important, the fact that you don't control your life. We try to, but so many things happen which we never plan. So live in the present moment, enjoy this moment and be kind. So in the end, I'll just say kindfulness, the most important. When you meet someone, make sure that the most, they feel like they're the most important person in the world because you're with them. Be kind to them. Another question, hi Ajahn Brahm, I feel I'm addicted to mobile phone. How can I overcome the addiction? Thank you. Throw the mobile phone in the Straits River. That's why it's, yeah, the, you know, in the, in the rivers. <laughs> why are people addicted to mobile phones? I think someone said that, they said it's like addiction to gambling because you check on your emails because it's exciting and sometimes you win. Like you get a, a message from someone you're waiting to hear their message from, but you always have to keep checking. And even though you know most times there'll be nothing useful there and you'll be wasting time, the time when you actually do see something there, which is nice, makes all those wastes of time worthwhile. If you see it for what it is, you realize that maybe you're just wasting too much of your life on that mobile phone. And instead talk to people. You know, sometimes, <laughs> I've, have you seen this? I've seen like two friends. You know, this is about sitting outside the kitchen in Boating the Island Monastery and they're texting each other. And they're sitting right next to each other, but they're texting each other because they don't know how to talk to one another. It's a weird world. But anyway, I think that I don't know how we can stop that, but you can stop that. But just say, no, I'm not going to, I'm going to say some texting, but not too much. If someone can come up with an app, an app which which limits the amount of time you can use your mobile phone. You know, maybe one hour a day or two hours a day, an app, and you can't change that app. You get it with the mobile phone, that's all you can do. I think you make a lot of money that way because a lot of people know they use these machines far too much and they love having some restrictions compelled on them. Yeah, it's an idea. Dear Ajahn, can you... Could you explain more on the concept of non-self, please? How is there no eternal self if each of us goes through thousands of rebirths in which ourselves are reborn again and again and again until they stop? How many times do you go to school in the morning? You go to school until you learn everything, then you graduate, you don't have to go to school again. How many times do you have to go to work? Get up in the morning, go to the office until you can retire. How many times you have to get reborn again and again and again until you understand what you're doing and then you stop. Stop getting reborn. And get so still that the self vanishes. And then you can, in that stillness, no need to get reborn again. So non-self is probably the heart of the Buddha's teachings. And you know, all all of scientists know that there's no self in there, but there's this process. But nevertheless, our society, our world, always encourages us to believe we are. They give us names, and they give us uh, biographies, and they give us this, this you know, who we are thing. And I'm going to, it's only one minute to go, I'm going to finish off with this story. I think I told it maybe a year ago, but now, because I'm getting old now, I've gone past my 69th birthday, next year's 70th birthday. And so I thought that, well, you know, you can get this senior citizens card in Australia, a Commonwealth senior citizens card, once you're over 65. So I applied for one, I applied online. And they said, no, no, you have to come into the office because of the danger of identity fraud. So, you know, I got, I was going into the nearest social security office. And so I got a lift and I made an appointment. And I sat in front of this uh, woman, this uh, person who worked for the social security government worker. And she said, we have to get you to come here because you have to 
prove who you are? Can you prove who you are? And I replied to her, because you know my character, I said, I've been a monk for 46 years, and all those 46 years I've been trying to prove who I am. It's a very difficult question. <laughs> and she got very irritated at me, said, look, I'm very busy, you know, please, can you prove who you are? And said, can I see your driving license? And I said, I don't have a driving license. Oh, can I see your credit card? I don't have a credit card. Your bank account, don't have one of those. Your uh, home sort of uh, certificate, you know, where you live, don't have one of those. Your rental agreement, don't have one of those. And they even asked, I was very proud of this, they even asked, your marriage certificate? I said, come on, I'm a monk. I haven't got any of those. And she looked at me and then she was kind. She said, you just don't exist. As a person in the government, you don't have all these things which define a person. And that's so true. I don't own things, therefore I don't exist. I don't own cars. I don't own property. I don't own, I haven't got a, a license for anything. And I was very proud of that. I think, yes, the Buddha was right. I don't exist. <laughs> but then, of course, I had my passport and I had two passports, a British passport and an Australian passport. He said, let's have a look at that. I said, okay, I'm not supposed to do this, but they'll do. And she gave me my uh, senior citizen's card, I think just to get rid of me. But as far as the government of Australia is concerned, I just don't exist because I've got nothing to prove who I am. Isn't that really cool? I like that. <laughs> anyway, uh, I've got my card anyway, so it's all right. So hopefully you enjoyed today's sessions. I'm sorry for those questions which weren't answered. And if any questions weren't answered deeply enough or thoroughly enough, I do apologize. I try my best and I really respect questions. I try not to actually to uh, criticize any question. They're great. So thank you for your questions this evening. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. See you tomorrow morning. Yeah, see you. Have a nice night's sleep. Sleep well after your supper. You too. No supper. <laughs> no supper for me. Then. No. <laughs> okay. Good night. Good night. Good night.